Joining us now is Kara Clearman. She is the president and CEO of Plug and Drive Ontario. And we welcome you to TVO. Thank you so much, well, Steve. Well, let's just start there. What's Plug and Drive Ontario? So Plug and Drive is a non-profit organization, and our goal is to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles. And really, we're doing this to promote their environmental and economic benefits. Is this a group that people join? No, we're uh, sort of a public interest group. We're out there trying to educate people on the benefits of these cars and encourage them to buy them. How long have you been around? We've been around for about a year and a half, but actually the project existed for about three years before that, before we actually became an official nonprofit. Gotcha. And do you, I mean, are you funded by governments or by private sector or what? Mainly by uh, sponsors, which are uh, private companies primarily. Presumably the companies that make these cars. Well, actually, no. Most of it is coming from the electricity sector, okay. OPG. We have uh, an, a very uh, great partner in TD Bank, uh, the power workers, uh, some of the manufacturers of charging infrastructure. And the automakers are certainly our partners. They help us with cars and events. And So do you represent them? No. no. What, what we try to do is we try to stay completely agnostic on the car hmm. because we're really... Uh, promoting the concept as opposed to any particular manufacturer. If it's a plug-in car, it's good, and uh, not too concerned about who makes it. Just uh, take a second here and tell us about these plug-in cars and whether or not, because, you know, we read a lot of stuff about, you know, sure. yes, they're neat, but they're not necessarily selling as much as people thought. Is this a growing thing? Well, it, it definitely is, and there are mixed reports out there in the news, and I think it is confusing for people. And actually, the cars are selling quite well. They're just maybe not selling quite as well as some predicted they would. But actually, in Canada, they're right on target with what sales were predicted. And uh, they're still targeting that, that these cars could be anywhere from 5 to 15% of the new vehicles sold by 2020. So at the all right, that, that's still, I'm doing my quick math here, that's still yeah. eight years off. So yes. at the moment... Is it fair to say they're not making much of a dent in the marketplace? Yeah, it's a small but growing segment. Small but growing. Okay. You recently did a deal with Hydro-Quebec. What That's was all right. that about? Well, you know, if you look at Quebec, they're quite far ahead of Ontario. And, and what, what they've in, in their infrastructure. So what they've done is uh, they have found a way to partner with retailers to get that infrastructure built more quickly and more efficiently. So, for example, they partnered with Metro Grocery Stores and Rona. And uh, by entering into these partnerships, those retailers installed a charger uh, and then uh, put, put the charger in and, and allow their customers to use them. And they collect a small fee for every time someone charges the car. And that way, Hydro Quebec was not necessarily, or the government wasn't necessarily paying a big price tag for this infrastructure. They're simply doing the coordination. And we looked at that model and we thought, well, that makes a lot of sense for Ontario. The Ontario government doesn't have to foot the bill for the entire build out of infrastructure if we want these cars to be successful. We know we need some infrastructure. And so what we did was we partnered with Hydro Quebec to say, we'd like to look at your business model for Ontario. And the best part of doing that is then it would be interoperable, which means drivers that are coming from Gatineau to Ottawa or Ottawa to Gatineau or eventually Montreal to Toronto can use the same system. Because all the plug-ins on all the cars are the same. That's right. Okay. It's not like, uh, what was it, VHS and Betamax. There's not two different systems no, out there. No, right now the, the 240 chargers, they're all the same plug. Now if you're going into, let's you mention Metro, let's use that as an example. Let's say you go in Quebec, you, you drive, you got your spot in the parking lot, you plug in, you're in the grocery store for an hour, hour and a half. How much would that cost to use their power to recharge your car for an hour and a half? Well, what they're doing is they're charging just a flat rate of two fifty a charge. So if you're there for half an hour, it's two fifty. If you're there for two hours, it's two fifty. Got it. And that was for simplicity for the early rollout. Just so we're clear, two dollars and fifty cents. That's right, two dollars and fifty cents. So. And to be honest, uh, that's a lot more than the actual electricity cost. They're making a profit on yes. that because you're only using um, probably a actually, quarter. But actually, the retailer gets that money, not hot to Quebec. But of course, okay. the retailer is going to pay an electricity bill. Um, yes. which is substantially less. So, of course, people are much better off charging at home uh, at night because that's when electricity rates are lowest, that's when the environmental emissions are the lowest, uh, and we have a surplus in Ontario at night. So, of course, we would really strongly encourage people to plug in at home at night and use those public chargers for sort of opportunity or emergency type charging. Gotcha. Let's, uh, I think we've got a map here. Let's bring up this map if we can, because you've got different charging stations all across the country. And Okay, tell us about the red dots. What's going on here? So these are the charging stations that are out there now, 
And actually, this map was put together by an organization called PlugShare, and they have an app available for your smartphone so you can find out where the nearest station is. And this covers off all the brands because what was happening was uh, a lot of the individual car manufacturers had plugs out there, but their maps only showed you know, their particular plugs. Right. And of course, we want to show all the plugs. Now, this particular map was made in the US, and so it's not super accurate for Canada. And so what we've done is we've partnered with CAA to make a Canadian map. So we're certain that these uh, chargers are available and they're where we say they are. Uh, and, and that map's going to be available in the next week or two. And in a perfect world, presumably there are charging stations kind of you know, everywhere, at the supermarket, at the hockey arena, wherever you might go and drive and leave a car for a while? Is that the world you want to see? I mean, that, that, that's what makes sense, is that we, we look at putting these stations, and they really don't need to be everywhere. They need to be strategically placed so that they're available to the people who need them. But it makes sense, you know, the gas station model just doesn't really fit because no one wants to hang around a gas station for an hour. So it makes sense to go where that con uh, consumer experience will be, uh, at a grocery store, at a movie theater, at a restaurant, at a hotel. A place you're going to be for at least an hour anyway. Do these kinds of places, grocery stores, hotels, restaurants, movie theaters, do they understand the need for this kind of infrastructure right now? Are they open to it? They absolutely are. I think, Where's as the I said, Quebec it? is ahead. They've already installed 100 chargers and they are at grocery stores, Rona, movie theaters. They, they are out there. Uh, British Columbia has announced a, a program to build, so, so they're building them there. And what we're finding is uh, retailers in Ontario are very receptive too, and particularly because, for example, there are a number of retailers who do uh, research to find out how long people spend in their stores. And you see evidence that Walmart does this type of research, you know, that the average customer spends 22 minutes in their store, and they'd like them to spend a little bit longer. Huh. So, for example, this actually would incense someone to stay in the store an hour. It would, wouldn't it? Now, when I drive around Ontario, though, I don't see much of this. I got to tell you, I think in Toronto, the only place I know of that does it is what is it, the brickworks or earthworks or whatever that's There's called? There's actually more than you think, and that's in a way, it's almost like a club. Once you have the cars, you tend to find out where they are, and there are quite a few around, and not as many as we need for sure. But uh, you'd be surprised how many there are in the GTA. There's probably 30 stations in the GTA. Huh. Um, some of those are very easily accessible, and some less so. What's stopping Ontario from diving into this headlong? Well, I think they have done quite a bit. Like, Ontario's put the rebate on the car, uh, and that's significant. Not every province has done that. So you get up to 8500 bucks back if you buy a full EV. Uh, that's very significant. And they're talking about other programs. They did put out a request for information talking about infrastructure build. I think they're being cautious on the infrastructure, again, because they understand that the home charging is really where the best benefit is. And so it's that balance between not wanting to discourage people from charging at home by making public charging all too available. I know you obviously love these cars. You own one love yourself. It. Yes, I You've do. You've got a Leaf, right? Yes, I do. Uh, do you think it's appropriate tax policy to give people $8,500 returns if they buy, uh, rebates if they buy these cars? You know, I really do, and, and here's why. First of all, uh, the emissions reduction is huge. You can go from, if you're driving a regular full-size car, you're emitting about 4,000 kilograms of CO2 a year, and you're going to drop it down to around 300 and something uh, kilograms. It's huge. It's like a 90% drop. Uh, particularly so you, if you charge at night. So there's number one. I mean, if, you're in, if you really are serious about meeting some emissions targets, uh, GHG emissions targets, mm -hmm. then this is a way to do it. So that's one. The other reason is Ontario currently has this nighttime surplus of electricity. All that electricity is made locally. All that electricity right now at night, we often have to give it away to other provinces. We actually have other, to pay people to take we it sometimes. We sometimes even yeah. pay other jurisdictions to take it. And so by plugging in our cars at night, we're actually plugging into the local infrastructure, the Ontario economy. That money goes straight into Ontario. And so I think it is a good policy to incent people to do so. And as long as that power is created in a non-polluting way, right? If that power is being created by coal plants, we're no further ahead. Absolutely right. It, it, yeah. You're still slightly further ahead, but there's not nearly the bang for your buck from a GHG emissions perspective. But in Ontario, we're down to about 3% coal. And at night, coal almost never runs because thermal power typically runs at the peak and so nighttime we're typically running on nuclear, hydro and wind. So you're, you're getting great emissions benefit by doing it. 
Carrie, you'll remember this movie a few years ago, Who Killed the Electric sure, Car? Sure, sure. So the electric car, I guess the rumors of its death were premature in this movie. Is that fair to well, say? Well, it's funny because there is a sequel out called Revenge of the Electric Car, okay. and it uh, explains how they made a comeback. And uh, it's a very optimistic movie in comparison to the, the, first, <laughs> the first edition. But yes, I mean, they, they really are on the way back. And I, I think most of the manufacturers would say it's not an if, it's a when. Uh, right now, we have a handful of manufacturers with cars available. In two years' time, there'll be twice as many, three times as many automakers with a vehicle available. And let's just explain how this works, because there's different kinds of cars. There's some of the plug-in stations that you were just talking right. about. Some of these cars, like the one you've got, you've got a Leaf. Mm -hmm. It is a battery-powered car only, right? 100% You electric. don't put any gas in that no, ever. Never. But it only goes 150 kilometers. That's right. So when you are out of battery, as opposed to out of gas, what happens? I got to plug in. You got to plug in. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, I, on the other hand, full disclosure, I've got a Volt, a Chevy Volt, right. which you can do about 50 to 60 kilometers on battery, mm -hmm. and then it flips over to an internal combustion engine. So we've got, and, and you can go another, whatever, 400, 500 sure. kilometers on that. Do you have a sense about which technology at the end of the day is going to be the more popular, whether it's a pure battery that you've mm -hmm. got or a mix, which is what I've got, or maybe right. there's other ones as well? Well, Steve, I just, I, I see them both filling a need. Uh, it's hard to say right now. They're somewhat neck and neck. Uh, and in different jurisdictions, it's interesting. There's a different balance. I think, you know, what we're seeing is uh, in Canada, 80% in of drivers drive 50 kilometers a day or less. So for so many of us, a full electric is perfect. We know our commute. It's a, t it's a you know, a, a repeated event. We know how far we're going every day. And so it's perfectly fine. And a lot of the early adopters are typically a two-car families. And so, you know, to have a car that's 100% electric, that does your local commuting, uh, and then if you want to drive to the cottage, you know, you have the other car. Mm -hmm. And so, that's so it's a second car. Typically in the early adopter. Now, we hope the battery technology is evolving, and it is, uh, that someday that car will go quite a bit farther and we know it's possible because the Tesla uh, which is available now too uh, yeah. although it's quite expensive What's the price tag on that I was just going to say it's yeah. very expensive but it can go about 500 kilometers so the technology's there and of course the the price just through you know uh, improvements and through uh, having having more and more vehicles available will come down and then that kind of technology will be available what kind of carbon footprint do these cars leave well, the, the, the fueling of the cars, if you're talking about 100% electric, uh, is about 90% less than a gas-powered car. Now, that's just comparing fuel to fuel, electricity right. to gas. If you do the full life cycle assessment, it's not quite as good as that because there's a little more energy that goes into making an electric mm -hmm. car than a gas car. But in the whole life of the car, it's the driving and those emissions way swamp the emissions from the making of the car. So it's still a, a huge emission benefit. And which companies, in your view, are the ones who are on the leading edge of making this happen? Well, you know, in the, in the early days of two years ago, really the only two cars available to us were the Nissan Leaf and the GM Volt. And, and now we have the Mitsubishi IME, Smart for Two is out, the Ford Focus EV has become available just this summer, uh, the plug-in Prius is now available as well. So now there's five or six different cars available. And, you know, next year you're going to see Honda, Volvo, BMW, Audi all having cars. And I think that will really, when there's more options for people, you're going to see a lot more uptake. How much are they going to charge for these cars? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Uh, most of the cars right now are selling, you know, anywhere from the iMeve and the Smart or at the low end around 30. Uh, the Smart actually is even less. And I think the, the Leaf is about 38 and the Volt is about 41. And some of the other ones, we're not sure. Uh, the luxury brands will be more, obviously. Okay. Um, let's try this. Do you see a day when, I mean, right now, as you pointed out, these cars, you know, they've made a pinprick on the map. But, That's true. But they're not. Do you see a day coming when people are actually going to be driving these cars and they will be the majority of the cars on the road and the kind of the gas station is going to be kind of a distant memory, that kind of thing? Well, I'm, I'm super optimistic. So I, I certainly see uh, that that's possible. And I think it really depends on uh, availability of gas and gas prices. Hmm. I mean, if we see a huge spike in gas prices, more people will be giving, uh, willing to give this technology a crack. And we do find, like, we do a lot of uh, public education around this and we do a lot of events. And when we do these ride and drive events, we make it possible for people to drive these cars. They say, wow, 
this is just a great regular car. And so you just, in a way, have to get people to try it. And they say, this isn't some strange technology that's not for me yet. Mm -hmm. It's here now, it's ready. And so I see it. Uh, the infrastructure is there. Uh, it wouldn't take a lot to get there. I think it's really possible. Give me a sense of the bottom line here. Because I know, for example, I used to drive a minivan, 70 bucks a week to fill it up usually. That's uh, right. Now I spend a buck a night on electricity for the oh, Volt. Fantastic. So it's a big savings. But is that typical? It is typical. It is. I would say I also drove a minivan and I was spending about $120 uh, in a month uh, and now I'm spending about $20. And so on average, our research shows the price tag to fuel an EV versus fueling a gas car is about one-sixth. Hmm. Do you see any other uses for these electric cars? For example, could they power your home somehow? Well, that is actually uh, completely realistic to happen. In fact, it has happened. Uh, Nissan has a what we call V to G, which is vehicle to grid type of unit that can be installed that allows you to move the power uh, to your car, as we do now, and then move it back into the house, for example, uh, if uh, we were short of generation. You could actually charge, run your house on the car. And this actually happened during the tsunami in Japan when they were very short of power, and they were plugging houses into these cars which were more available and people ran their house for two or three days off a of Nissan Leaf. They, hang on, say that again. They ran the power, the, the electricity needs they had for the home, they ran off the battery in their car. That's right. No kidding. Mm. Is there anything potentially dangerous about running your home on a battery that's in the middle of your car? No. I mean, these, these are, uh, as long as your charging system was installed safely by a certified electrician, you know, th these are, are well understood technologies. I mean, the, the batteries are actually not much different than the batteries we use in laptops and other electronics. And so we're quite accustomed to sort of the charging cycles and, and we have a lot of knowledge in that area. And so this is, this is really doable. Okay, let me ask you one last thing and I'll be a bit of a killjoy here. You know, there have been lots of predictions over the years about how we were, you know, all going to be on diesel by now, we were all going to be driving hydrogen powered cars by now, or, you know, any number of different scenarios. Certainly. Hasn't happened. You know, what you've described today is another potential scenario, but it may not happen. You know, if oil is, uh, you know, half as expensive to, uh, a month from now, uh, that will certainly delay the embracing of this new technology, would it not? You, you could be right. I, I remain optimistic simply because ultimately carbon will be priced. It isn't priced right now. When carbon is priced, these things become even more economic than they are now. Uh, on top of that, when we have this issue of a surplus of electricity that we lose money on at mm -hmm. night, it, there is a strong economic driver to encourage it in Ontario. And so I think, you know, with the help of the province and the companies and groups like ours, you know, we can encourage people to do it in a way that it, that it won't go the way of the hydrogen car and the natural gas car. Kara Clearman, it's awfully good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.